Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm uh, my name's Jonah Cowell, and uh, I am the host today of our Open Observability podcast. Uh, here at Open Observability, we talk about anything related to DevOps observability and, of course, open source. Uh, I am uh, extremely excited about the discussion today because we have a rarely seen um, person joining us who has a very interesting background in this space. Uh, and I would like to, uh, to welcome Steve McCann on the podcast. I'm just going to add him in here. Hey, Steve, how are you today? Good, Jonah. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. Awesome. Uh, I also wanted to thank Logs.io for hosting the podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, anyone that's interested in joining uh, in for discussion or getting involved, definitely reach out through the website, openobservability.io. Uh, so uh, yeah, I guess uh, to kick things off, uh, I did want to mention uh, Steve's background. Steve is uh, the CEO at Brim. And he's got a, a small startup that he's been building that's doing some really interesting stuff with uh, with databases and visualization. Uh, Steve is uh, has been working on various things in this space for quite some time. The reason that I uh, it asked Steve to join us was because a really hot trend is BPF in the industry. And uh, I, I'm excited to say that Steve not only was involved in the creating of this technology, but also a lot of other technologies that we use day in and day out, like libpcap uh, and the formatting involved in pcap, along with uh, things like TCP dump that I probably use every week and have for the last 20 plus years. Um, so yeah, Steve, appreciate you joining us and um, yeah, I just wanted to to dive in a little bit here uh, on cool. uh, on where this stuff came from and what you were thinking and and your colleagues at the time as well. Hey, um, Jonah, I I just want to say I really appreciate you kind of digging up this story and <laughs> it kind of means a lot to me. Kind of I, I had to beg I had to beg a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad that I eventually got my way yeah. um, and that you'll be able to share some of this really cool stuff that. I just don't think people really talk about it uh, much. And we just sort of assume this is some new amazing technology that just came out of the woodwork in the last few years. Uh, I, I actually didn't know much about BPF until maybe five or six years ago when it started to emerge as an interesting telemetry data source. But in reality, tell us a little bit about maybe where it actually came from. Uh, and the origins of, of how it was created and when it was created and who you were working with. Yeah, sure. So so I do want to say the new BPF, it really is um, some amazing new tech. And the old BPF was kind of the, the seed that had a place in the kernel for this work to begin. Um, and it had some concepts that were new way back when um, that helped the BPF project today get, get sort of worked out and all, all um, in place. But um, it goes way back to when basically I was a kid in college and I was kind of in the right place at the right time. It was 1988 and I took the, uh, the compilers course at UC Berkeley. And this fellow uh, was, he was guest lecturer from the lab up on the hill there, the Lawrence Berkeley lab. And he came down and taught this class and uh, I really liked the class and he was kind of this mad scientist guy that I, I kind of like appreciated his brilliance around uh, software architecture and programming um, compared to some of the other professors that can be more theoretical. He was very practical. Um, and he said uh, he had a summer job. So I approached him and said I'd be interested and he hired me. So that summer I didn't work at all on BPF. But it was a really interesting time because that's when Van was doing his work on TCP congestion control. Mm. It's when the ARPANET was stop. It just was. It would just stop working. Um, by '88, they fixed it, and he was writing his paper on it. But it was probably '85, '86 when it just stopped working, and the people didn't know why. So they collect data and figure out the problem, and then Van solved the problem along with Mike Carls from uh, the Computer Systems Research Group at Berkeley. Uh, with his famous paper on congestion control, slow start, and the congestion avoidance algorithm in TCP. And since then, there's just been a ton of work on it. 
congestion control and all sorts of different algorithms. And Vans kind of stayed involved with that stuff. Um, but to do that work, he needed to look at the packets on the network and debug his protocol and algorithms. And so he took this code that was uh, a program called the EtherFind on Sun on CentOS, which was a fine tool that lets you look at packets on the network, but it didn't quite have the richness he wanted. So he started writing protocol printers, especially for TCP, on top of EtherFind, which was proprietary source code. Mm -hmm. um, and then he named that TCP dump because it was dumping TCP packets at the time. And then obviously over time, we added support for lots more things. But it was the next summer in 89 that he he wanted TCP dump to be open source. And so he gave me just the printer code and he kind of walled off the proprietary CentOS code. And so that's when I wrote the device driver, the kind of came up with the model based on some other work of Jeff Mogul did some interesting work on packet filters downloaded into the kernel. And then there was this uh, project pro thing called NNSTAT from uh, ISI at USC. Uh, Bob Rain did that. And so we took these ideas and we tried to make it really efficient because part of the problem Van ran into is, is EtherFind would drop packets. And so we wanted to be able to download into the kernel a filter just to select the traffic you were interested in. And so I wrote that device driver. I did the, um, I, I, I kind of did the architecture of that whole thing. And, you know, Van, Van was mentoring me along the way too. And, uh, and I had taken the compilers course. I was really interested in compilers, and and so I did the I did the language for the TCP dump language, and, and an optimizer that would take the, the the byte codes that got compiled and optimize them. And and there was some interesting work there. Um, and then uh, and then later we did some like we did a little bit of like this some of the stuff that appeared in BBF later, um, like. Uh, JIT assembled code for native architectures, taking the byte codes in the kernel after they've been checked for safety and then JIT compiling native code. Uh, but that never made it into the actual, that was more experimental. Um, Interesting. And it wasn't on the EBPF project came along. Because it's all compiled now. So you're saying you were thinking about doing JIT, but then you never really. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. never really made a production quality. I was off doing other things and multi IP multicast and real time audio and video over the internet when people said video over the internet would never work. <laughs> I guess and now look we're doing it in like a web browser, you know, it's pretty yeah. it's pretty crazy yeah. where it's gone since then. Yeah. So but it's funny because and I just thought of this, I mean observability was the main reason that you even went down this path, right? Because you had a problem to solve you didn't have the right tools to observe what was happening. And then you basically built the tools, started observing it, and then were able to actually solve the problems with the visibility there. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Very uh, corollary to what was going on. So maybe you could tell us like, you did all this work in the late eighties, but then a lot of this stuff didn't come out until the early nineties, right? Like what was the gap you were just, busy with other stuff or was there some other forcing function that like made it? Yeah, it was, paper? I think so. I, I actually went back and looked at the change log and there are, I think our initial public release was in um, 1991. Okay. And so that was sort of after I had done that work over the summer and I had taken um, a year off and I worked full time at LBL and Vans Group between 90, 91. 91, I went back to, to grad school to do my PhD. And uh, uh, what's my train of thought? What we, uh, with the timing. So we did that release. And then at some point, I think it was another summer during my PhD program, I'm like, you know, we really need to like finish that take the packet yeah. capture code out and make a library. And I think that was 94, if I, I looked at the change history. And um, the idea was we kept cutting and pasting the BPF system out of the TCP to C source code into other tools. And I was like, you know what, there should be a library. And so that's where PCAP came from. And then part of that library was being able to write packets to disk and that became the PCAP file format was just like, here's the struct header you need on each packet and that was it. And yeah. that, that got improved later as well. 
um, with uh, PCAP NG. Yeah, so during our discussions, like I didn't realize the differences between BPF or classic BPF and eBPF, which is kind of the newer version. And obviously it seems like the new one's a lot more capable in terms of what you could jam into the small set of, uh, of memory that you basically had previously. Uh, like, were you involved in what happened with eBPF or maybe? Not at all, not at all. No. I mean, I, yeah. I, ever, I, I would hear like, there's this guy doing stuff with BPF and Linux and I'd go look at it and I'm like, wow, this is interesting. But I was not, um, no, I wasn't really working in the area. Okay. And now but you didn't it. talk, who was working on that stuff? Was it Brendan or someone else? I know that Brendan did a lot of work and then there was somebody else. I don't really know the history all that well. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I have I have taken a look at the architecture, super impressive. And at the time, if somebody said, hey, I want to do what, what um, BPF does for packets for kind of all probes and system calls and stuff in the kernel, yeah. I probably would have thought, wow, that, that sounds cool, but would that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably I, not with the processing the time, power yeah. that you had then, but today, you know, with the Linux kernel and the size of you know what it is yeah. uh because so initially it was all focused on networking and then it was extended to do anything in the system in terms of just making a general yeah. interceptor profiler i mean you could do a lot of stuff with it outside of the network yeah and the real brilliant thing in there is this idea that you could actually take c code and take c lang and do a back end for the for the byte codes or, or the in, intermediate representation of, of, of the BPF virtual machine. And that's some, um, C-Lang didn't exist back then. And that's something that I would have never thought of at the time either. But, <laughs> and this idea that you can like, like put these probes in any entry point anywhere in the Linux kernel and they have a whole approach for that. Yeah. We didn't, I mean, we had debuggers that would put traffic break instructions. Points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. points, but, but nothing like this um, full instrumentation, which is, which is really the kind of the impressive thing that occurred in the Linux system, which made eBPF possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do have a funny story when I, um, you know, I wrote a paper, you can follow the links, to the, 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 you can Google it and find it online. Um, and I presented at the, the um, Hughesnex conference in 1992, I think it was in San Diego. And this guy got up at the end of the talk and he said, he asked me this question. He said, why bother? Computers are getting faster. They're only going to get more fast. Why bother with all that? Just filter at the user level. It's not a problem. And I, you know, I was a kid. I, I didn't know who this guy was. And I gave some snide remark like, well, I like to do other things with my workstation while I'm filtering packets. <laughs> and it turns out that was Brian Kernigan. <laughs> my office mate from LBL, Vern Paxson, who's another kind of legend and in the internet came up to me afterward and he said, Steve, you know, that was Brian Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, hilarious. Uh, and the better answer would have been, well, networks are getting in as fast too, as fast as computers are getting. That's faster. the problem. And yeah. you know what? I think in 20 or 30 years, people are going to want to use this to trace system calls and everything else in the kernel. So we need this. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I wasn't that pressured. No, but it's crazy to think like now you can't even do uh, packet analysis, like aggregated packet analysis, like we could do even 10 years ago. I mean, the networks are just way too fast today yeah, exactly. to even do that stuff. Yeah, networks got faster than CPUs in a way. Or but if, maybe it's not the CPU of network, it's the bottleneck in between. Like that's right. But also you do it in a distributed way. You can still get really valid insights out of it. You just can't aggregate traffic like you used to. And, you know, I know a lot of what you did at Riverbed was like figuring out how to aggregate, accelerate, and and analyze also traffic, right? So is that kind of, uh, what yeah, was your we evolution? Did, we did yeah. that through an, a couple acquisitions we had done. And and that's actually when I met this this, uh, this guy, Loris Deggiani, yeah. who's another legend in kind of PCAP world and BPF world. Yeah. Uh, and he started his latest company. Yeah. Oh, it's been a number of years ago that was essentially doing BPF and I think they 
in the kernel, I think they switched over to use it and their values on layers. They of are, yeah. They switched over the company Sysdig and they actually made an open source project called Falco for security that's part of the CNCF. That that's right. It's all BPF based now because yeah. when they first came out with it, you used to have to put a kernel module in, which everyone was like, I'm not putting a kernel right. module in. Right. But fast forward a few years and with BPF, you can basically add this stuff you can uh, trust pretty, it. yeah, That's pretty what's so easily. impressive about that whole architecture is you can put code in the kernel and completely trust it because it's all sandboxed or or tested or kind of <laughs> safety checked. Mostly trusted. <laughs> Mostly trusted, <laughs> except for a bug here and there. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, the next thing that I'd like, well, maybe a little bit more about the thinking around your co-founding of Riverbed. I know you were working on video streaming uh, really early days. And, uh, and it, it, like, was that part of the evolution to wanting to do, you know, the vision at Riverbed or where, what were you thinking when you- You know where that came out? from is I, I had done a, I did a startup before Riverbed called Fast Forward Networks. Yeah. And we were acquired by this company, Inktomy, that was a web caching company and a search company um, and, uh, they had this great lead in search and kind of like got distracted with CDNs and caching yeah. and stuff. And um, they ended up in Akamai, right? Over time. I think Yahoo bought the search. Yahoo. Company. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, when I was at Ink to me, I remember the, 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 the office in, uh, London couldn't access the marketing files <laughs> on the server over Microsoft SIFs. And I'm like, well, what the heck is up with that? So I, I got interested in this problem of, um, you know, storage, the storage protocol acceleration over the wide area. And then as I worked on it, we realized we could apply the algorithms we came up with for all traffic. And that kind of created a new approach to the WAN optimization market that it was called at the time. And uh, that went pretty well, but over time, the need for WAN optimization kind of, kind of dwindled. But that's where, that's where that came from. And and like I said, we we really got into like packet stuff through this acquisition of Loris's company and this other company in the, in Boston. Well, I mean, now that like protocols are, well, it's interesting because at the same time, there we seem to care about fewer protocols because we stuff everything into HTTP these days. Right. Yes. In many ways, now the problem is starting to exist just in an encapsulated layer, right? Yep. So when you think about the problems, we still have performance issues, although there are fewer of them. And now it's much harder to diagnose them because we no longer have clear protocols between different functions right on the network so that's true i was just chatting with uh, my team the other day and we had this problem where the front end guys wanted to put this timeout in if if there's no port open to connect to and i'm like well doesn't the library tell you so that <laughs> and and the answer was no you couldn't tell inside of like the node process for this particular api whether you weren't getting an answer back because the server wasn't responding or you weren't getting an answer back because the connection didn't get set up. And it's just like, guys, let me draw how TCP works. <laughs> <laughs> you may need well, to change the API we're using. <laughs> they probably assume that your code is just going to want to wait till it picks up. So it just probably sits there in a loop, like waiting. And it's okay. That's what Gmail does. It works pretty well. It says retrying in 10 seconds. And yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so I guess I wanted to learn a little bit about how BPF, and I know since you and I started talking a couple of, a few weeks ago, uh, you started playing around with how you could use BPF and your new venture, which I'd like you to explain exactly what you're doing. Cause it's pretty fascinating stuff yeah. and how these things potentially link together. So maybe. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you're up to at Brim and uh, and what you built over there. I think it's really cool stuff uh, and it's open source. So, yeah, sure. Let me let me kind of set up Brim and then I'll talk about the connection of BPF, which actually kind of was motivated by this conversation as well as another interesting conversation I had recently. Cool. Um, so I got 
into this data problem. So Brim is a uh, early startup. It's kind of been self-funded and um, a little bit of friends and family investment. Um, and we've kind of been in this research mode. I originally thought I would work on um, on a kind of like a, a security oriented uh, analytics and search system that was optimized for the Zeek open source project, if you guys know about Zeek. And I got interested in that because um, I mentioned Vern Paxson was my office mate way back in the day. Well, he had worked on Zeek way back in the day. Funny. And he was one of the first users of that libpkept library for Zeek. It was called Bro back then. Yeah. Um, neat name after Big Brother 1984. Be careful what you do with this. Um, but And now it's uh, nowadays it's Ricotta, Ricotta. right now. So, Suricata is the company behind it, right? I believe. Um, Suricata is an is a complementary technology. To oh, Z. okay. Yeah. The company Burns company is called Corelight. That's it. And Corelight. then I got involved with Corelight as an advisor and investor and um, helping them out. And uh, they weren't really working on the search and analytics problem. They were just like using Elk or Splunk. Their customers would deploy uh, with with that, that kind of stack. And I was like, "You guys are expert, world's experts in this. Well, don't you want to work on this?" And they're like, "No, we're really busy just focusing on our core business," which was a great decision. And so I said, "Well, you mind if I work on it?" And so I went and I started this project. And the more I worked on it, the more I realized, you know, Vern and those guys are security guys. I'm not a security guy, but we really, um, we built this system around the Zeek log format, which is typed, it's got schemas in it, it's very rich. And so I got drawn into this problem about data representation. And I wanted to just take something off the shelf that worked like Zeek logs, and it didn't exist. And you're, you're either setting up complex like ETL data pipelines to put your data in a data warehouse, and then you gotta figure out how to you know set that all up, manage the tables and the relational schemas, in the warehouse, or you're sending it to a system like Splunk or Elk, and you're yep. turning these rich logs into JSON and throwing all the great information out. And so I just, with the more we worked on the problem, we realized that it was data. And so we've kind of been this research project for about three years. We finally got the thing out. The project's called Zed. The data model's called Zed. Um, the way I like to think about Zed is it's, there's this, the, there's this uh, paradigm of data around structuredness. You either have unstructured data, semi-structured data, or structured data. And what I realized was actually structured data is not really, it's, not, it's really tabular structured. It's not super structured. And so Zed has a type system built into it that allows you to get rid of schema definitions and replace them with a the type system. And that type system Every value has a, has a very well-defined type. Unlike semi-structured data, there's no type system. In order to understand the shape of the data, you have to traverse the, the object. But with Zed, you, you have a type for everything. And it works out really nicely in terms of like being able to do data introspection, data discovery. And you basically can have the best of both worlds where you have, you, you, you have, the, you have basically virtualized tables using these types in a pool of data that looks like MongoDB or Elk or whatever, but it's actually all typed and structured. And we call this super structured. I'm, I'm rambling on, sorry. <laughs> no, that's cool. So uh, to bring it back to observability, and I asked you this question before, how is the performance of this for, let's say, time series data versus unstructured log data versus trace data? I mean, is it is the performance good for multiple use cases because of the way that you're doing the typing? I mean, how is... I think it is. It's still early, so the jury's a little bit out, but I would I would make at least... We built a lot of stuff and people could try it out and it does perform pretty well. So, um, the, so, so to get to performance, the thing that... The other thing that didn't exist is you kind of... You have JSON with JSON schema to add type information, all that, that's kind of a mess. Then there's Avro and Parquet, which are nice performant formats. Avro is row-based, Parquet is column-based. But in order to put your data into Parquet, you have to say what the schema is. And then all of the values have to fit into the column. So now you're back to this problem 
of like the data warehouse where they have to ETL. manage those yes. schema. Yeah. And so with Zed, because of Zed's superstructure, it actually, we created um, four formats, but three are the main ones where there's a format called ZSON, which is play on JSON. It's human readable, it's user friendly, and um, it's actually a superset of JSON. So all JSON documents are Z values. And, um, and then adhering to the, the exact same data model um, is a row-based form format and a column row-based format. And because and, and they're called Zing, ZNG, is the row-based format, and, and Zest, Z-S-T, is the columnar format. And if you just think about the columnar stuff for a little bit, the idea is if I have this type system and everything's typed, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encode a sequence of heterogeneous records without having to say what the schema is up front, the columns in the Zest format just self-organize around the type system. And so I don't you, have to think about You don't have to deal with indexing and various other things when you go down that path. Yeah. You still may want to do indexing, but the columnar structure is um, is just it, it, it's in theory just as efficient as um, Parquet or any other data warehouse columnar form. Yeah. But I don't have to define the schema. So it's really nice. And so, the, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say the other great thing about Zed is it's like the, the streams are self-describing. So I don't have to set up a schema registry or or create protos to compile my protobuf things. I can just send the data over the network between endpoints. And there's no ODBC or anything. I just hit an endpoint and it comes back zing. And it's super efficient. Cool. So before we get to the front end, because that's actually where I'm really enthralled at what you've built over there. Um, where do you see the database going? Like, how are you going to scale this? Like, are you going to build a scale out system for it? Like, what's the goal to like turning this into a production data warehousing or data lake type system, which is obviously part of the goal, right? Yeah, we're still working on like, what's our go to market? What's our product positioning? But it'll definitely be a service. Um, and so what, what we've kind of built so far is a Zed lake as a service. So we're calling it a lake because it's not it's not like a table format like Iceberg or or Delta Lake. Um, although we I think we can get there um, in terms of being like a layer that has updates and stuff. But right now it's like append only, which is more like the Elk Splunk model. Um, you can delete stuff too. But we made this really nice API to the lake that looks like Git, so you can commit data very easily, and it's. It, it sort of recognizes a bunch of formats and you just hit the endpoint, it auto recognizes what you're loading into it. And then these commits appear as uh, atomic asset commits into the lake. And all of those data structures are designed to scale out um, on a cloud type of model. And so all of the all of the data gets stored as Zing or Zest in the lake and it gets indexed so you can search it. And uh, the data structures are all immutable. So it's really easy to cache stuff. Everything has a unique name. And um, and so and, and so you can parallelize it too with this kind of model of shared cloud storage and caching. So you can take a query, just like a data warehouse is, will optimize a, a, a yeah. query. You can distribute it and and uh, scan the data out of the cache, out of the out of like S3. Um, and optimize these queries and, and scale up to cloud scale. We haven't, we're, we've just started deploying on the cloud and have just, we're testing with a few users right now. And, you know, we have a roadmap to, to really make it scale. Okay. So cloud. the other thing I was always really fascinated by, and I know you did this specifically for Zeek, was Brim, the right, the UI, the front end. Yeah. And it's uh, it's pretty slick. Like I find it a lot more advanced than most of the unstructured search tools out there. And yeah. I was, you know, kind of saying, why don't you make this run on Open Search or Elastic Search as the back end, so that people have like a better experience when they're analyzing data. And uh, now you've obviously hooked it up to Zed, right, to make to do yeah. that type of analysis. But um, I think it would be cool to to maybe show that or maybe talk about it for a couple of minutes and then yeah yeah 
Yeah, so, so one of the things that we did when we were playing with the security uh, idea initially before we sort of said, hey, let's just focus, really put all our energy into data is this idea of a really easy to use app. And I mentioned the compilers course way back when and the TCP dump language. I like languages, so I've, I've kind of had fun um, trying to figure out you know, sh should we just do SQL? Uh, people like Splunk and Elk because they don't have to type SQL queries. At the same time, you you want you want to do SQL, and the super structured nature of Zad allows you to do SQL. So I've I've been working on this language, which is it's kind of like a log search language, but it's closer to SQL. And then SQL select expressions are an operator in the language too, so you can use SQL. Um, I love the idea about connecting to 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 open search as the back end and having the better like front end, but I don't know, there's only so many hours in the day and, and kind of our strategic focus is on this data model. So that would be a whole different project, which is to create a front end that's better for, for a JSON based document model back end. Sure. But in some ways, uh, because it's a subset of what Zed does, I mean, obviously there's still API and language differences, but it seems like you could easily visualize and deal with JSON, right? Data in terms of visualizing it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Sure. It's e um, I mean, that's an easy It's open problem. source if somebody wants to do it. <laughs> send us TRs and maybe we'll have a look. Yeah. At and after the episode, I'll also post links to a few of the things that we've talked about. But cool. uh, maybe you could show us uh, a little bit about the and maybe talk a little bit about the fun hacking project that you started working on a couple of weeks ago with uh, combining BPF and and maybe yeah. what you've done. Uh, and also show people the cool UI for Brim, which I like a lot. I wish I could use it more often than I than I am able to. But cool. So I just shared my yeah, screen. Let me add that into the stream. Oh, I can show that. Can you see that now? Yeah, maybe make the yeah. yeah that's good. Sure. Here's my uh, let's see, this is my uh, cheat sheet. Uh, sorry. Um, so basically, here's here's the uh, here's the app that Jonah talked about. I have over here a Linux host running in in VirtualBox. Oops, sorry. Um, and the Linux host I used as this BPF experiment to capture data using um, some modified B BCC tooling. So this, by the way, this repo is public. So if anybody wants to go look at it, it's brim data slash ZBPF and you can play on it. And I'll post it on the YouTube page for those uh, watching Great. after and want to check it out. So, so what I did was I took these two BCC tools, Snoop Exec and Stacktrace. Snoop Exec lets you see all the programs that are launched with the exec system call. And uh, Stacktrace shows you kernel stacks at a at a, a, a particular function in the kernel. And and then I just I I just changed the I added a dash Z option so you could output it as Z data, Z song that gets posted to a lake. Um, and I won't go into all those details, but I just I, I just hack this in as a proof of concept. Um, and then I I ran this work. There's a work a little script I ran to generate a bunch of activity, and I collected the data. I'm not going to reproduce that now. It's pretty easy to do. But there's a lake running that received the events in Z format from BPF. And so if you've ever looked at any of these formats. Um, the data kind of looks like this and it's, it's a little bit of a mess but the beauty of Zed is like you could do things we have this thing called fuse that lets you take the different data shapes and fuse them all into one schema um, and so now I can see it as a table so I can see here's all my stacks and, and this, the user stack is not very useful so let's just like drop it new stack and then I can see these are the events from exec snoop over here. And, and these are the events from the stack stuff. Um, and one of the things, uh, 
we have in here is this like ability to have a query library. And, and if you grab this file here and you drag it in into your Grim after you install it and play with this data, these queries will show up. You just drag it right here into here. Um, and then you just click on them. And so this is my fuse. Uh, this is without the U stack. And, and the interesting thing about the superstructure of Zad is that everything has a type. And so, and, and types are first class in Zad. So you can do anywhere, you can put a value in the query language. You can also put a type. And so you can do something like this, which is count by type of this. And so this shows me the two shapes of my data that was generated by the B, BPF tooling, the stack shape and the exec sh shape. So that also has named types. So these are actually named types that, that the code and the BCC tooling uh, named them with these types. And then this is just a query that counted up the types. So I, I call this, you know, shapes. Um, and then you can, we have the sample command. You can actually sample, get, just get a sample of shapes. When you have a lot of stuff, this is really handy to see all the different shapes. Um, you have, and then, you know, you can just do lots of interesting queries. This is, this is counting the stack by its depth and just how many of each depth is there. And you see repeats here because the stacks were sampled every one second. Um, so like how, cause this is similar to a time series, right? Where you're looking at kind of like something that's happening over and over again. Have you exactly. thought of how in your language or how in the database you would deal with time series data really? Like, is that a problem that you've thought well, about? I, or? You know, I, so, so the lake design has the notion of a pool key. Okay. And, and if you make the pool key the timestamp, which is what's going on here, then you could do efficient range scans over time. Right. And then if you combine that with indexes, you have a nice way to deal with time series that are organized by time. And if you store, if you have time series that are really just a bunch of numbers right. with maybe timestamps, if you store that in a Zest columnar format, it's going to be really fast to just scan columns. And and that's that's the kind of classic data warehouse stuff you could do, but now it's it's kind of in this search experience in the right. same way. Um, and that's why you asked before, is this going to be a good approach for telemetry data? And I think the answer is probably yes, because depending on the data, you can have ingest policies that decide, should I put these metrics in columnar format? Right. Um, or should I just leave it in row format because I don't need the column format? In, in observability, there's actually a couple of companies that have decided to build their own what I'll call them as indexless columnar type formats and databases specifically for telemetry because they just didn't find anything in the open source landscape that was really that efficient. Yeah, and I, I suspect at the end of the day when we get this all like tuned and the performance working and the analytics operations all, all working really well, that those purpose-built time series things will still work a little bit better than this. But I think the ease of this and the fact that you put everything together yeah. and it's super easy, I think is going to outweigh the little bit of performance. Yeah, that's the challenge is right now most people run a different database in observability for time series and for unstructured, which would be logs and traces. Exactly. And there isn't really anything that's bringing them together. The one project that's in the works is is uh, which is open source, so I'll mention it is uh, is IOX from Influx. Right. They're working on a new version of basically Influx DB that's supposed to handle both types of data effectively, but it's okay. it's not out yet. It's in basically an, an early beta. But you know there are certainly some new databases that are of interest to people doing observability that try to bring it together but i think it's still a gap in in our industry and we end up having these two databases and then you try to do crappy ways to join the data which is usually time-based and not the best you know the best way to analyze yep so that makes sense i'll have a look at that i i think i look i i can following that stuff. Um, I just want to show this one. This is like, uh, like we try to think through all these cases. And this actually goes back to the Zeek format, which had this a set data type. So you can actually do things like 
give me the union of all the lengths of all the stacks, call that stack depth, and then group it by the, by the name, the process name, and then you get a nice little table that looks like this. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's a search system too. So you can just like type 24 here and that's a search for 24. Um, nothing else 22. Uh, and, uh, or, you know, I can, you, you can use keywords. So there's the find. Um, and, uh, I mentioned tables and SQL. So let me show you just this real quick. Um, so like I said, SQL selects are, um, are built into the Z query language. So you can actually say select star from exec. And then the from in this case is not a table, but it's a type. And so, um, because types all, because this exact type all has the same shape, it looks like a table. Right. And all of a sudden I can do SQL values in here. You mentioned, um, well, I can take the output of that and I can mix it with Zed. Um, you mentioned joins, this is sort of contrived, but I can do a select of all the PIDs, take the union, call them PIDs. I could take the name and then I could take the min and max of the lengths of the stacks. And then what I'm doing is I'm actually joining stack information with the exec information. And I'm joining on over here, I'm joining on PCOM, which is the name from the exec snoop thing of the process and name, which is the name from the, uh, I don't know why they're not the same. I didn't do this, this is BCC of, of the stack count thing. And then you can do a group by. So you can do joins. And um, these joins also work across pools, but this is just using the type system to do a join within the data in the same pool. Very Does cool. that make sense? Yeah. yeah, very nice. So other, uh, while you're in the UI, it's all textual. Do you have like plans to make it do more uh, graphical analysis or graphical representation? I'm not sure how to approach that. It's, it's such a big investment and at the right time, we may wanna do that. I'm almost more interested in, in integrating with other vis visualization tools. So for example, if, if we supported a full ANSI SQL dialect, then we could plug into Parasat and other BI tools. Um, I know that gets away from this nice search experience. Another yeah. um, project we're, we're working on is to, which actually isn't all that much effort, is to integrate with notebooks. So from Python, you can easily hit the APIs and uh, from something like Observable, which, I mean, I just look at Observable and, and Mike Boss, Postdoc's work. I, I don't know that I can compete with that guy, so. I'm trying to figure out how do we just work together instead of reinvent the wheel on this. Um, and what's nice about the lake model is the observable um, uh, client can do a long polling query and, if, and, and, and use a query lambda that you name. And if the query lambdas are these queries here, as I change the query la lambda for this query, it could be reflected into the back end and immediately updated in the notebook. So there's a nice way to integrate with notebooks where I could have a bunch of viz over here in a notebook. And as I'm doing searches, the viz just stays in sync with, with my searches. So, so that's what, kind of the next step on viz, but I, I, I appreciate the question. It's, it's, yeah. It's kind of so what, what is the technology that you were talking about for the visualization observable you were saying? Yeah. This okay. One. It's this one, yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Oh, it's a SaaS platform for doing visualization. Got yeah, it. Yeah. So when we have the cloud service running, yeah, we can author little things that know about Zed. Yeah. And then as I as I change my search here, the yep. query lambda will immediately cause my notebook to show the viz of the search I just ran. Right. Yep. Cool. Very nice. Uh, that's vaporware right now. But we think we will have a prototype in, in a month or so. Cool. Uh, 
so uh, you said that hacking around on this the last couple of weeks like gave you some new ideas. Is there anything you want to share with the yeah, just the, on, the, on this yeah, stuff? just the idea that um, that in BPF. Oh, I, I didn't mention the other motivating uh, conversation was with a, a colleague I have at um, a research university. They're doing a bunch of performance measurements of databases using BPF. It's a great way to instrument like and figure out as you BPF people all know, uh, performance issues. And so what they were doing was they were writing custom BPF programs and then generating CSV as output. And uh, massive amounts of CSV, running out of disk space, having to manage all the CSVs and try to do analysis with Python on these CSVs. And uh, my colleague reached out to me and I was like, I think he was like, are you working on the Z thing? Won't that help with this? And I'm like, sure. So the idea is to take all these CSVs and you can just put them in a lake. But wouldn't it be better? I mean, part of the problem was they would have all these CSVs and then they'd change what they're measuring and the schema of the CSVs would change and their code wouldn't be impacted and all of that. Whereas with Z, it's all self-describing. Just throw it all in a Z lake and just leave it there. It's in S3, it's cheap. And, uh, and, 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 and you don't worry about the schemas changing. And then the other problem is when you go to CSV is you lose the the richness of the information you have at the source. So the BPF code is actually taking a C data structure using the C types typically in Python using C types, the Python library, to be able to take the C types, be able to access the C data structure from the kernel in Python and then do something with it. And they were generating CSV files. And I just thought, you know, part of the proof of concept here with this BPF data was to just hardwire Zson, the text, yeah encoding, but Zson's way less efficient than Zing. And if we could have a serializer that could just take a C types data structure and give you Zing directly, all of a sudden you have a super performant way to get event data out of BPF and into a data lake. Yeah. Uh, and so that was kind of like, if there's interest in that and people want to work on that or people want to work with us on that, it, it might be an interesting direction to go in. Yeah, sounds... Sounds like it would save people a lot of time versus the way we do it today. Because when you do look at a lot of the implementation, CSV is still front and center with BPF, which is, I mean, it shows some of the immaturity, but it also makes it ultimately flexible, right? Because you don't have any proprietary data format in there. Um, but yeah, certainly I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, this, there was this, uh, this summer, I think it was in August, Alex Rasmussen wrote this article on CSV. I loved it. It got a lot of interest. It kind of went viral. And he's this basically just a rant about all the problems with CSV. And then he's like, well, then what are we going to do? And I'm like, Zad. So you, you mentioned uh, that you can put all of the data into S3. Is there a way to run that as the back end natively for, for the data lake, essentially? Like, yeah. does it know how to access the object storage automatically, or do you have to? Yeah, yeah the code's yeah. actually built with the uh, object model in mind. And then when we run it locally, like I am doing here, we just map the object store onto the file system. But uh, all the APIs and the code are dealing with uh, the, the way S3 and GCP work. Okay, good, cool. And it's, yeah, a, it's a really nice consistency model because in a single round trip to the storage system, you just have to probe for one one object and if it's not there then you know all of your state is in sync yeah uh, with with any other reader or writer yeah for sure yeah there's a lot of uh newer observability data stores that are now using s3 and then they basically put a stateless query layer across it exactly. to scale it out yeah. and then they also have to add some caching like a mem cache or some exactly. other type of caching exactly. system yeah so, so you actually in, we're just in, following that same design. Yeah, thing. yeah. In open source, uh, there is uh, it kind of started an observability with a CNCF project called Cortex, which is for time series. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the same model was actually applied by Grafana Labs to Loki, and um, and they they have a trace data store uh, Tempo as well, and they all have a general similar construct to that where they've 
basically built a bunch of scale out microservices on top of S3 with some caching. And, you know, that's, that seems to be a really cost effective way to store a lot of data. So. Uh, oh, it's very cost effective. Yeah. And yeah. Then, and then the Z model is really nice because the indexing, it's not like Lucene and Elk. The indexing is distributed. So you can, um, you can move the data to, to like, um, I'm blanking, but cold storage. Oh, yeah. like Glacier, you mean? Like yeah. Glacier. And then yeah, you yeah. can still search it because you have the search indexes if you keep them around. So you keep the search indexes in a different store than, or you keep them with the... They're alongside the data, but they're in a separate file. And we basically okay. create an, a little cloud object for every big thing we we index. And then we can automatically... Uh, Point move over. Indexes yeah. around. Um, okay, cool. But uh, I just, I wanted, you asked about cloud. I wanted, I'm not, I'm loath to try this. This is our cloud instance. Oh, let me share, I'll share your screen again because I oh. took it out of the stream. You're back. Okay, so up here, you can you can select your lake. So the model is the lake is, this is kind of like a Slack app where a lake is like a, an organization or a team. And then pools are inside these things. And, and I'm actually, I'm live connecting here to, I'm a little worried about clicking on because it's. Oh, this is your cloud version. This is actually running yeah. in the cloud and it's a little slower. We have some performance things we're working on, but there it is. So that's running on S3 and yeah. there's an instance on EC2. And then I can switch right back to the, uh, my BPF your local pool, one. Yeah. which is running here. And then yeah. there's a lo there's another local one that Brim launches on the Mac here, which is here and I got a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Here, this nice. is like, here's the, like, uh, it's nice for developing when you can like switch between different environments and, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of data is this that you're showing? Oh, that was, uh, Zeke this, data. This or... is a little welcome data. Um, this oh, is, yeah. uh, that we're going to put on our cloud when people sign up. This is just a really limited, uh, set of Zeke logs. Yeah. But they're all in the, um, this, this format so I can say things like count by type of this. So tell me all the shapes of the data. There's only two because there's just two DNA types. Logs. Yeah. And I was looking for, I don't think I have it here. Um, oh, here. There I have lots of logs in here. So now these oh, are all nice. these logs. There's some Suricata stuff in here. And yeah. the end knows we, we, we we're doing the security stuff and knows a little bit about security. So you can um, bring up a detail view and you can. You can look at all this stuff. Um, yeah, I like the way you visualize the drill downs and stuff. The weird stuff. The weird alert. I think I'm going to go um, can zoom in. Nice. Oh, and then here's the packet button. So we did this integration with Wireshark where when you have a the connection information you can click on the packet link and it'll launch a it'll extract just the packets that are part of that weird connection oh that's and, cool so yeah, it'll yeah. set up the filter for you and start capturing um, it's not capturing it's just it it has a stored pcap that was imported into into the lake okay and then it's got an index of the packets so that when you want to drill down on a particular connection tuple, you can do that really quickly. Cool. So it's still it's still useful to we we have you know quite a number of users who just love this desktop experience. Yeah. And being able to like I can take this PCAP file and drag it in. Um, I just think there's a bigger opportunity in trying to work with vendors who do security and and partner with them and have you know build out their data lakes for them and. Yeah, you know, cheaper, faster, better way than sure. Current solutions. Sounds good. Cool. Um, any uh, other final things before I jump into some a few news snippets? Yeah, that... wait, I, I see we're kind of on the hour, and you have your news. Yeah, yeah. But, sure. um, Thank you for setting this up. I'm, I'm yeah. I, I, I'm really happy that I was able to talk about. Tell this little story of the history of BPF and, and show off a little bit of what I'm working on now, which 
doesn't have to do so much with DPF, but there's this <laughs> interesting connection that I think if people are interested, let, let us know. Um, For it's sure. an open source project. You can follow the links that Jonah will put up. And um, and there's a Slack, public Slack channel if you want to jump on and play with Awesome. Them. Do you want to stick around for the news or you can sign off? It's totally up to you, but um, feel free to chime in. I've just got a few news items, but I wanted to thank you very much for joining us and sharing all the cool stuff you're working on, which is always intriguing. And um, and just thanks for your time and uh, continuing to build this stuff in open source, which I think is really critical just to, to give people the ability to play with it and understand it. And uh, I find the work fascinating that, that, that you're doing. And uh, I'm sure we'll stay in close touch. But thanks for sharing the story and really giving people the perspective that a lot of the stuff that we do today that's that looks like uh, we're way outside of the realm of what we were doing before. In reality, it's all grounded in the same fundamentals, like your, your TCP story, where you have to explain to developers you know, DNS works like this. It's been working like that forever. It's not, you know, some magic thing that, uh, you know, that doesn't exist anymore, so. Yeah, and we keep just solving the same old problems in different, better ways. <laughs> Faster, bigger, more complicated. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'll stick around while you do the news. Okay, okay. cool, sure. Update, so go ahead. Yeah, definitely. So I just had a few news items since our last episode uh, last month. Uh, those of you that, and I'll, and I'll post these also on YouTube. So you'll see them if, uh, if you're watching this after, but Prometheus came out with a new agent mode. So this basically allows you to use part of Prometheus without the time series data store. So you can kind of use it as an agent and do querying and, and other capabilities that are part of Prometheus, even alerting without actually storing the data. So it's kind of runs it as more like an agent. Definitely something to uh, to watch if you're using Prometheus uh, for time series. It's a nice little capability. Um, the other, the second news item is Jaeger came out with version 1.28. It's a minor release. Uh, there's some interesting improvements on adaptive sampling in Jaeger, um, and that's that's kind of the only major thing of note in that release. And Jaeger tries to do releases every few months. So we're trying to make that more consistent in the project. So you'll see releases coming out, even if they're not major, um, just kind of improving things there. Um, and then there is a couple of things on open telemetry I wanted to mention to those tuning in. Uh, there is a really cool project that, uh, that's been done, which uh, takes open telemetry and runs it as an operator in Kubernetes and does automatic uh, instrumentation for Java. So the for Java, Python, and Node.js, um, Pavel Lafe over at Red Hat uh, actually built this thing. It's a really cool idea. So you basically run this as a sidecar, an application comes up, and it automatically does the injection of the instrumentation and the data collection. So it makes it kind of a nice way to do auto instrumentation, especially if you're running like a shared Kubernetes environment. Um, and then the last one I wanted to mention is that uh, the open telemetry Java library and agent is at 1.9 and they've added uh, a bunch of capabilities, including uh, logging and metrics, which are in alpha. Um, and some nice auto configuration stuff that they've added into Hotel Java. So definitely a lot of new stuff coming out of that group. It's very active. I try to participate a little bit in, in that working group as well. Um, so those are probably kind of some of the major news items in, in open source from the last uh, few weeks. Um, Steve, want to chime in on any of the stuff? I know you're not super... Um, plugged in to you know, I, I, I'm not and I'm I'm interested in learning more so I'll, I'll yeah all I'm right sure cool. I wouldn't say anything intelligent about the updates yeah and uh awesome well uh I did want to mention our next episode which is uh is going to be a really cool one uh, my colleague Dotan uh, Horovitz will be hosting uh Frederick 
uh, who's the founder and CEO at Polar Signals. These are the guys that do a lot of Prometheus work. They've uh, they built a really awesome uh, uh, profiler that actually uses Prometheus data sources, and it's pretty interesting. They've been building that out, and uh, and Frederick uh, he was a senior principal engineer and the main architect for observability at Red Hat before he founded uh, um, Polar Signals. And uh, he's a core OS guy. He's a maintainer of Prometheus and Thanos and, uh, and does a lot of work in Kubernetes as well. So he'll definitely uh, be a great guest for Doton and they'll talk about Prometheus, continuous profiling, which is a really hot topic right now, um, and how to collect that observability data. They have an open source project called Parka that you can check out that does basically that Prometheus uh, profiling. Uh, it will be airing December 16th. Uh, definitely tune in to that. Follow us on Twitter at Open Observe uh, for details and updates and all that. So, Steve, profiling, it's like your favorite thing. Totally. <laughs> So it is actually really interesting to take like time series and profiling and like figure out how you mesh those together. Because the problem with profile data is it's really hard to analyze like over time. And if you summarize it and turn it into, you know, time series, it actually makes it pretty, pretty useful. So it's more like um, I think this I'm going to promote that again. <laughs> the idea that you can just put raw yeah. data in. And you can easily have automated. We have a really nice API to have orchestration that can yeah. do rollups and aggregations and have everything ready for an app to go hit the. Uh, hit yeah, the, uh, for sure. Game. Awesome. Well, I did want to thank you again for joining us, and um, I'll talk to you soon enough, I'm sure. And uh, good okay. luck with all your endeavors, and uh, appreciate your time today. Thanks for everything, and thanks to everybody out there watching. Appreciate. Awesome. It. Thank you. Bye.